Hey, Life Group, it's Pastor Caleb. Great to see you all together for another week. I'm not actually seeing you, just so you know. I can't see through the screen. I'm recording this, so. Uh, but I, I'm glad that you're together for another week of Life Group. And uh, as we continue our series called out, I'm glad that you're taking time to dig into these concepts that I really think will benefit our church as we grow together. So before we get into the study for today, uh, take a couple minutes as a group and uh, tell somebody or tell the whole group about somebody in your life who exemplifies humble service. Somebody who exemplifies humble service in your life, or maybe somebody who has already died, um, who you knew as a child, but somebody in your life who exemplifies humble service. All right, let's get into the study. Um, the first question I wanna throw at you is about the main concept of the whole sermon, which was that Christians do ordinary things and that ordinary action fuels the movement of the church. And I was struck by a quote that I heard uh, by reading Twitter actually a couple days ago. Um, it was about another church in, in the United States um, that they were talking about a program that they were running and they had a reply to their tweet. And I, I wrote it down so that I could quote it to you exactly. Here's what um, somebody said to them on Twitter. They said, you guys, say all, uh, excuse me, you guys say you're all about helping the poor, but all you do is run programs to build up your own organization. I'll say that again for you. You guys say you're all about helping the poor, but all you do is run programs to build up your organization. Take a minute or so and discuss amongst your group. Is that true of the Christian church at large in the United States and Canada? And then secondarily, is that true about Cross of Life? It's a hard thing to hear criticism like that, isn't it? If we look at our own programs and we look at the way American Christianity has kind of operated for the last 60 or so years, we see a lot more of building up the organization than actually doing good work in the community. Of course, there are churches that do that and God be praised for those. Um, but that's something that we as a congregation want to do as well. It'd be interesting, not now, but as you have conversations with each other later, think about ways that maybe our congregation can make a real impact in our community. Actually get boots on the ground and, and hands into people's lives so that we can serve the people of this community. The second point I want you to discuss today is the concept of envy and selfish ambition. So in the sermon, we said that uh, the two things that James says destroy, first of all, your own soul, your community, and your relationship with God are bitter envy and selfish ambition. And let me just redefine those for you. Uh, we said envy is the Greek concept of zelos, which is where we get the English word zeal. Um, it's not just seeing something that somebody else has and saying, I want that thing. It's essentially fixating on something or someone and letting that thing control your thoughts and control your emotions. So I gave you examples of maybe there's a person in your life who you see and they just make your blood boil and it, it could be for you know, a sin that they committed against you or could just be part of their personality. Secondly, we said selfish ambition is basically any time I want the world to revolve around me, that everybody will do things the way that I say, the way that I want. So my question for you is, which of those two is more of a challenge for you? Take some moments and share that with your group. I'll tell you that I struggle more with selfish ambition. Uh, envy and the idea of fixating on other people, I do struggle with that, but one of the benefits that I have as being a pastor is being able to constantly go back to the scriptures and think about all of you as people who need to hear those scriptures. And so I'm pretty comfortable with the idea that you're all bad, like you're all sinful just like me. So I'm never surprised by that. But what I do struggle with is wanting things to go my way uh, because I do have a vision of what our church could be and it fits with what our congregation has already put in place. And the spreading of the gospel in this community is something I just want really badly. Um, so when things don't go my way, I get frustrated. Uh, the next point I want you to discuss is the word that James uses to describe what happens when we are envious or selfishly ambitious. He says it is unspiritual, earthly, and demonic. Now in the sermon, I talked about demonic as more than just what we think of maybe from horror films, like heads twisting around and you know jump scares and these sorts of things, but that we understand that the demons actually work in our lives in very subtle ways. I just wanna give you two scriptures to think about. One of them I talked about in the sermon, which was when um, Peter came to Jesus and said, Jesus, you're not going to go to the cross. You shouldn't do that, that's a bad idea. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, 
Satan, right? He says, get behind me, Satan, because it's obvious Satan was working through Peter at that time. And we probably wouldn't say Peter was demon possessed, right? But Jesus certainly thinks the demons were active in his life. Um, another time would be with Judas Iscariot. When Jesus is betrayed, the Bible tells us that Satan put it into the mind of Judas to betray Jesus. So obviously, Satan has some capacity to put thoughts into our minds that lead us down a path to doing the things that, well, James says are evil, wicked, not just for our faith, for our community, but also against God. Why do you think that we as North American Christians have such a hard time understanding the demons as subtle and sneaky like the Bible portrays them? Take a couple minutes and discuss that with your group. James then starts to tell us what a life that is marked by good deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom looks like. And he gives us a number of descriptors, and we walked through them in the sermon. I'm just going to read them again for you. Um, this is from James chapter 3. He says, The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, and impartial and sincere. Now I put those on the screen for you so you can look at them for a second. I would encourage you to pause the video here and then discuss with your group which of these is the hardest for you to enact. Our second last fill in the blank for Sunday was that uh, seeds of peace produce righteousness. And we said that when we sow peace in our relationships, we start to see righteousness coming out of the people into whom we sow peace. We actually see that the goodness that we want out of other people usually comes when we're willing to invest peace in them. Uh, tell a story to somebody in the group or their whole group about how that has played out in your life. Has there been a person that you've shown forgiveness or kindness to, who you've made peace with, who in turn you've seen the harvest of righteousness come from? Last question for the night. Uh, I referenced a verse from 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter 2, 12. You can look it up if you'd like to, but basically the verse says, if we live such distinctly Christian lives that the people who may not even believe in Jesus see us and say, wow, there's something different about you. The Bible tells us that there will be those who are actually attracted to that want that and will ask us about who our savior is and they will come to believe in him my last question for you and it's a challenging one is what is it going to take for us as individuals and us as a congregation to live a distinctly christian life not just so that the world sees us as their concept of christian that pe there are people who are nice or sort of looking for the common good but distinctly christian so that the world can't handle the way that we operate take a couple minutes to discuss that Thank you everyone for being at Life Group. I hope you had a great time enjoying Christian community and a further study of our sermon. I encourage you to be in church on Sunday. We're going to take the other half of this ordinary versus extraordinary uh, dichotomy and the uh, concept of a movement and an institution. So make sure you're there on Sunday. Encourage someone who maybe you didn't see there on Sunday to be there. And if anybody from your small group today, your Life Group is missing on Sunday, get on their case. Because we know that when living stones come together, the spiritual house is built and God shows up. God bless your week and I'll see you on Sunday.